Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to the house of the Lord. And we hope and trust that uh, everyone's had a good week and uh, excited to come to worship the Lord. We got a full service planned for you today, and uh, there's going to be a little bit of something for everybody. That, so if you can't uh, plug into something today, we, uh, I don't know what we're going to do. But uh, we're just so glad to have each and every one. We've got a baptizing to be done uh, at the end of service today. That's always an exciting time when we get to, to do a baptizing and to know that it's, it's, one, of our, it's one of our young ones. And, and that's exciting to be our, our third in the last four weeks that we've been able to baptize into the kingdom of the Lord. And we're excited about that. And, and, and that's a reason to rejoice. And, and we hope that you are as well. There's a lot taking place within the works of the church. A lot of those things are scrolling on your screen, and, and uh, I'm going to touch base with a couple of those. Uh, one is our golf tournament that was scheduled in April. Uh, they rained us out, and we rescheduled to June the 8th, so there's still time to, to get teams involved and sponsors, and if you like to register a team, there's information right here. You can do that, and if you like to get some sponsors to help sponsor the tournament, there's information in the foyer about that as well. And if it's not out there, if you'll see myself or Randy, we'll get you hooked up to make sure that that's done as well. Our children's home uh, does an annual thing. I know y'all probably have been aware of this or seen this at one point in time, the little blue bags. Y'all remember the blue bags? Um, <clears throat> you're supposed to take these little blue bags home. Don't leave them up here. Take them home and put your extra change in them and, and bring them back at the end of the month and we turn these into the children's home and you'll be surprised throughout our denomination how much money uh, children's home can raise through these little blue bags. But let me give you a little secret. The clear Ziploc bags work just as well. Uh, you know, so uh, if you fill up the blue bags, get your Ziploc bag and fill it up too. And we'll be bringing these all together and collecting them the last Sunday in the, this month. So keep that in mind. In fact, I think uh, Last year, they raised something a little over forty thousand dollars, and that's for our children's home. In fact, we uh, went yesterday uh, to the children's home for the five k run. Um, Tim, did you want to say anything about that, or I can't get up there. you can't get it because she ran yesterday. She, <laughs> but uh, but uh, we did have a good time. We had um, seven, I think, to go and participate in the five k run. We had a good time. Um, it, it was interesting enough that Candace. And Tiffany, I think uh, one finished second, one finished third in their bracket. Give them a hand. <clears throat> I was impressed. They were surprised. <laughs> but uh, we appreciate everybody for going to those that helped sponsor the event as well. And uh, we had a good time. We had a good turnout, in fact. So maybe next year you can uh, make plans to go and be a part of this as, as well. And uh, be much in part and much in prayer for that. Uh, we do have our barbecue chicken coming up uh, this this month. I think it is on the 18th. So um, begin to gear up towards that as we look towards paying off the debt of our new family life center. So speaking of that, we will be having a building dedication uh, for the uh, family life center as well as the other building that we've had to do some extensive repair and remodel on. Uh, all of that will be in, uh, in one service on June the uh, second. And we hope that you'll come and be a part of that. That will be at uh, 4.30 start time. We'll have a, a time of reception. You can walk around and see the building, and then we'll go into the time of dedication. And the choir will be singing. And we've just got a lot, of, a lot of good stuff planned for that day, and we hope that you'll be much in prayer for that and come out and be a part of our building dedication Sunday as, at that particular time, June the 2nd uh, at 4.30. That's on a Sunday, so we hope that you'll make plans to come and be a part of that, okay? And um, anything else I need to touch base on? Okay, good. We're going to go into our time of worship. And if you have any questions about any of the events that's in your bulletin, please uh, ask someone. We'll be glad to guide you into that. This, today we're going to start a series, a uh, sermon series called The Footprint of the Church. And today we're going to look at the, <clears throat> the church that pleases God. And, and it's going to come in a little different direction that you might want, might would think. But, but it's important that we understand that that which pleases God may not be the first thing that comes to our mind. It may not be the first thing that makes sense to us. It may be that thing that you have to scratch your head and wonder, God, are you really doing this? But we're going to talk about that, the faithfulness that pleases God at the footprint of the church. And, and it's actually going to come from Daniel chapter 6. 
Now, Daniel chapter 6, most of you know, is about what? Who can tell me what Daniel 6 is about? Daniel in the lion's den, one of the most popular stories in all scripture, and it can be very dangerous and very hazardous to us because we do know it so well. Because we put so much emphasis on the right comma, the right period, we breathe at the right time, we stop at the right time, and we put the proper emphasis on the proper syllable, and we know it so well, and, and, and it can be a danger to us because we don't pay attention to some of the stuff that's trying to teach us. But we also have a tendency to make it a format, a template, that if we do what Daniel did, we could survive the lion's den, and we miss the whole point of the faithfulness of God. So we're going to look at that today, and we hope that you'll be much in prayer as we delve into that in the rest of the month as we look. We are going to take a break on Mother's Day and focus on moms a little bit, and, uh, but we'll pick that right back up and conclude it in the month. So we're looking forward to that series, and we hope to be much in prayer for that. Today, as we come to time to worship, <clears throat> there's no greater name than the name of Jesus. And if you don't believe that today, we hope that before you leave... You'll believe that. There's something about that name. Let's stand and sing that together. It's on page 177 in your hymn book, or it's going to be on the screen for you. that again, but I want you to do something for me as we sing this. I want you to do it in a prayer, of, uh, an attitude of prayer, that this is not just a proclamation, it's not just a song, but we want it to be our heartbeat. <clears throat> we want it to be the very essence of our soul this day, that Jesus, there's just something about that name, and regardless of the troubles, the trials, the brokenness, the scratches, the scars that's in your life, Jesus is greater than all those things. So let's sing that together, will you? Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Cause he's master, he's master, he's savior, Jesus. this out, church. Don't be ashamed. Many that's um, on our prayer list and many that has uh, I've gotten text and phone calls from different ones and <clears throat> and we just want to lift them all up before the Lord and our, our ladies that are down in Myrtle Beach that are heading back home sometime today, I, I, th I think they're going to probably stop at every Tanger outlet there is between here and there. <clears throat> I'll go there, but anyway, uh, they're traveling home today, so keep them in prayer. They've been down for the Women of Joy Conference, and they've had a, 
a good time. Uh, the one time I spoke with my wife while she's been gone, but uh, <clears throat> they've been having a good time, so keep them in prayer. And uh, remember our church and all that has taken place and the sickness and all that is rampant. It's good to see Mel back with us after his surgery. Amen. 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 Without the cane. Did I see you walk in without the cane? I've been walking 12 days. I had surgery a few days ago. I'm Praise God. That's wonderful. Good to have back. Also good to have Chris back with us too. And see, press us on to that next step. I think Friday. 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 So. Any other requests on this side over here? Yes, sir. Then he is having a biopsy on Tuesday, so pray that all goes well. Absolutely. Any others? <coughs> yes, sir. Way back here in the back. Okay. He's still there. Good. 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 Remember the family of Wanda Costner. She was our folks then, a uh, long time friend of ours passed this week, so keep her in family in prayer. There's no others. Uh, I'll just, David, would you come and lead us in this time of prayer? And as we, <coughs> we do so, we want to remember the service, that the Lord have his will and way, and that we just might uh, just come into his presence and say, Lord, here I am. Speak and let me hear what you have to say. Uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us all here today uh, together to fellowship with one another and worship you. Lord, I pray um, that you would open our minds and hearts to uh, uh, hear what you have for us. And I pray for Tim as, uh, as he's preaching today, Lord, that you would, um, you would use him to present your word. Pray for all the uh, prayer requests that um, were lifted up, Lord. Uh, pray for uh, everybody who's going through um, different trials and, and, and um, even those who are rejoicing, Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, uh, please help us have a good week and honor you in your name. Amen. Amen. As we continue our time of worship, we do so at a, a cherished time, a time that we can worship through our offerings, that which we have an opportunity to, to give <clears throat> to the Lord. It doesn't matter how much. It's just a matter that you have a heart to give, that you might respond to God's call as he has this opportunity set before us to worship him in our tithes and offerings. Ushers, would you come and lead us in this time? Good morning. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to come and yield ourselves unto you. And we ask that you just strengthen us now that we might do that which brings glory and honor your kingdom. As we come, we take this that you have given us, a part of what, we've give, what you have given us, and we offer it back to you. And we ask that you take that and bless it and anoint it, that it may go out and that others may hear the word. Give us the strength to be able to do that which brings glory and honor to your kingdom, knowing that everything and all things is because of you. All the good is because of you. And we restate that. There is no bad in God. It's all good. And we thank you for it, to be, for you being a good God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 
At this time, we want to ask you to take the opportunity to stand and turn around and greet your neighbor. Choir, if you will, make your way to the front, and Children's Church will dismiss following the choir.
go to Sarah and said, y'all don't hide them in a closet over there. Those of you that uh, remain behind, turn with us, if you will, to, to Daniel chapter 6 as we look at in the series of the footprint of the church, that which pleases God. And uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, Satan is trying his best for this sermon for some reason not to, to take place. Um, this throat of mine is kind of here and there, so I may lose my voice halfway through and I may sound like a cat been stepped on his tail or something. Um, I just have to look down, and I printed out the wrong notes, so there ain't no telling where we're liable to end up. Because <clears throat> we're going to go on my memory for the most part. Why did I print those out? Hmm. There's not a whole lot there I can use. Okay. Daniel chapter 6. In this particular passage, again, like we said earlier, it's a very, very familiar passage of Scripture to us, because we... We, we've heard it since we were in kindergarten, in children's church, in, in nursery. We've heard the story of, of Daniel in the lion's den. And as we come to this passage, and we're not even, we're not even going to get close. We're not going to get to the lion's den. So if y'all are anticipating the lion's den account, we're not even going to get there, okay? Because what we want to deal with is, is the faithfulness that pleases God. And, and here in, in Daniel chapter 6, we find that a new king is come on, on the throne, if you will. A, a new king is in place. And as we look at, at this story, this account of something, of faith that pleases God, we're not talking about a martyr, one that has given their life for Christ. We're not talking about that. We're, we're not talking about a missionary that goes across into other lands to, 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 to carry the gospel message. We're not talking about a missionary. We're not talking about a pastor. We're not even talking about a leader of a significant Christian organization. We're talking about an exiled slave to a foreign land. We're talking about Daniel. He is, is the faith. His is the faith that, that pleases God in the circumstances in which he finds himself, that God has planted him in. And in the process of this, Daniel pleases God in his faithfulness. But not only that, we see the faithfulness of God unfold very quickly as we see these things taking place here in Daniel chapter 6. As Darius, the new king, takes place. Now, the previous four, five chapters, we find that Nebuchadnezzar, he was on the throne for a while. And, and back in Daniel chapter 3, we have a very similar take place where he built this tremendous idol and wanted everybody to bow. And, and, and the, the Hebrew children said they weren't going to bow and they were thrown into the fiery furnace. The same template, the same example is taking place here in Daniel chapter 6. Different king, different thing taking place. In the process, we find that Daniel and the, and the Hebrew children, they came, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is what we know them by, and, and, and they came in the, in the place in, as exiles in the land of Babylon. And they were tried to turn these Hebrew children, these Hebrew people, into Babylonians. You look at what they tried to do to Daniel. They, they, they changed his diet. That still didn't make him Babylonian. They, they changed his language. It still didn't make him Babylonian. They changed his place of residence. That still didn't make him Babylonian. They gave him position, power, money. But that still didn't make him a Babylonian. He still maintained, he still was faithful to his God. And, and we'll see that throughout this passage as we look in chapter 6 here about the faithfulness that pleases God. We need to know today that it's not our circumstances that determine who we are. And you may be going through some hard circumstances. You may be going through some hard things. You may be going through some things you don't understand. You may be hurting in ways that you've not told anybody. You may deep down have more questions that you could possibly find answers to. Yeah, I don't care what the circumstances are. Those circumstances ought not to define who you are. Daniel 
did not allow the change of his diet, the change of his residence, all the power, all the prestige, and all the promotions change him from whom he was to who he belonged. He was God's child. He was exiled. He was a slave <clears throat> brought into Babylon and placed in this position. But that didn't change who he was. His faithfulness still remained to God. And, and as we look here, we find that it's the king's change. We, we see that Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, I think it is, uh, for some reason, he, he, God led him out and he began to live as a wild animal. Until such time as he was willing to bow in his heart and recognize that God was God. That he wasn't. <clears throat> we really don't know what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Once he was restored, he just kind of faded off into the sunset. So we find that there was kings that came along, Babylonian kings. And then we find the Medes and the Persians came along. The Greek reign came about. But yet Daniel remained. <laughs> Belteshazzar was his name. That's what the Babylonian name for Daniel was. And we find through the fifth chapter, through chapter 5, that Belteshazzar is everywhere. But when we come to chapter 6, it's Daniel. All of these kings have come and gone. All of these circumstances have happened. And everything that took place in Daniel's life, all of these things took place, but Daniel still remained. He was still God's child. They couldn't make him a Babylonian. They couldn't turn him into something that he was not because he belonged to God. His faithfulness was to God because God's been faithful to him. Also, we find that in the process of this, that King Darius, he set up a ruler. He set up a, 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 a structure. He set up a 120 uh, shatcoms, which is the leaders of, of, of the parts of the kingdom. And then he, he set three presidents, which of whom Daniel was one. And we find that Daniel found favor and <coughs> was pleasing to Darius. And Darius, in his mind, was going to set Daniel over all of these. Now, I want you to know an important thing, and I want this to sink in to you and me today. Verse 2, it says, And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. What was Daniel's faithfulness? It wasn't lobbying for better circumstances for the exiles. Daniel's faithfulness was not feeding the hungry. Daniel's faithfulness was not even preaching the gospel. Hear me. Daniel's faithfulness was that the king would have no harm. His position, his role, his purpose, according to verse 2, was to have those give account unto him that the king should have no damage or report no loss. Daniel's faithfulness was working where he was placed in order for the kingdom to succeed. That was his faithfulness. He wasn't trying to Judaize Babylon. He wasn't trying to Christianize his world. He was being faithful to what God has called him to do. Those of you that may work at GE, your responsibility is not primarily is not to make GE a Christian company. It is not your primary responsibility to make Sanders Ford or, or to make any company that you work for a Christian company. Your responsibility may just be that the king suffers no loss. That through your faithfulness and your work ethic and through what you do as a child of God, the kingdom benefits. That was Daniel's faithfulness. <coughs> That's what he was doing. In the midst of all, in all the positions that he was in, and all the promotions that he had, it was to make sure that the king suffered no loss. <coughs> now, wouldn't that be wonderful today? <coughs> we'll get through this. <coughs> that if people would see in us the faithfulness of our God, through our faithfulness to God, in the abundance from God. <clears throat> that they would be so willing 
to give us that position, to place us in that position to do for them because they see your faithfulness. They see your integrity. They see your work ethic and because of that, because of your value in God, they would want to put you there. Hmm. All to live that kind of life. That's what they've seen in Daniel day in and day out. They've seen a man of God. They've seen someone that believed and lived and done what they, he exclaimed in his life. So, you know, faithfulness to God is a faithfulness that brings honor and brings tribute to the kingdom. It blesses man. If you're faithful to God and you're living by his commandments and you're doing what God has called you to do, <coughs> you're going to be a blessing to those around you. And that's what Daniel was. In every occupation, in every place that he was, wherever he was placed, <laughs> he was a blessing to those around him because of God's faithfulness in his life. So we find that in the midst of this, that same faithfulness can be problems too. But before we get to that, do you know Daniel was doing what? Daniel was told to do? Go, go back, if you will, to, to Jeremiah, I think it is. <coughs> back a couple of, a couple of books. Jeremiah chapter 29. And, and, and we know chapter 29, verse 11, fairly well. Although sometimes we drag it kicking and screaming out of context and beat it to death in order for it to say what we want it to say. But... But verse, one, that's another, another message all of itself. Verse 1, though, listen, Nebuchadnezzar sent the letter, or Jeremiah, rather, sent the letter from Jerusalem. Now these words of the letter that Jeremiah, the prophet, sent from Jerusalem to the residue of the elders which were carried away captives, to the priests and to the prophets and to all the people who Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. That's Daniel and the boys. And after that, it says in verse 2, uh, the queen and the eunuchs and the princes of Judah and, Jer and Jerusalem and the carpenters and all the smiths who departed from Jerusalem by the hand of Elias, the son of Shepham of Jemarah and the son of Hilkiah, and Zedekiah, the king of Judah, sent it to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all the cap carried away captives, again, that's Daniel, from Jerusalem to Babylon, verse 5, listen closely, build your houses. Dwell in them, plant gardens, eat the fruit. Verse 6 says, take wives, get wives for your sons and your daughters, that your daughters to your husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may increase there and diminish not. Huh. Daniel was doing what he was told to do. He was in exile. He was a slave. He was taken away from Jerusalem in his place in Babylon. <clears throat> but we find out that Jeremiah tells him back here, live, do life. Build your houses, have families, grow and prosper. Now, now, now listen, verse 7, it says, Seek the peace, the well-being of the city, whether I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof thou shalt have peace. <laughs> so Jeremiah told Daniel and all of those that were held captive, just because you are exiles, just because you are slaves in a foreign land, live life. Build your houses. Have your families. Get wives for your sons. Give your daughters to be married. And let them have children. Let them prosper in order for the place that I have placed you may have peace and may prosper. Wow. What a mandate. What about us here in America? We are not a holy nation. 
God has used this nation, don't get me wrong, God has used this nation like he's not used any other nation in the world in a long time. But we need to make sure that we are pleasing to God first. That we are inhabiting our cities in order that they may prosper. That we're not a, a drudge. That we're not pulling down our society. We're not pulling down who we are. That our footprint, that our church is leaving, is one that brings peace. That one that brings prosperity. That one that brings welfare to our, our great communities. That everyone is thriving. Everyone is prospering. That's what Jeremiah told the exiles these slaves to do is live life according to God's word. And that's exactly what Daniel is doing. He was living life for 70 years. He's in exile. Probably in his mid-80s when we come to here in chapter 6. And, and because of his stance, because of, of what he was doing for God and the favor that he was finding not only with his God, but also with Darius the king. Darius wanted to place him over all the kingdom. Now, there were some of those that come around in <clears throat> verse 6, no, verse 5, not, well, even verse 4, didn't like him. They hated Daniel more than they loved the kingdom. Because the kingdom in which they loved, Daniel was prospering. Daniel was doing a lot of good things. But you see, he wasn't one of them. He didn't look like them. He didn't talk like them. He didn't eat like them. They didn't like him. <coughs> Verse 4, it says, Then the presidents and the princes sought to, to find an occasion against Daniel. So they done some, some, some conveil. Uh, they went and they, they searched and they, they done some intel and, and they tried to find something on Daniel. And they all came back together and we couldn't find nothing. Daniel done everything. To be sure, they thought Daniel was not one of us. Daniel didn't look like us and all of those things. To be sure, there's something he's not doing. There's something that he may be doing that the king's not going to like. But they came back and they couldn't find nothing. Because Daniel was doing what Daniel was told to do. He was living his life. He was making sure that the king suffered no loss. Whether it was King Darius or Nebuchadnezzar, whether it's uh, Belshazzar, ever who it was, Daniel was making sure that the king suffered no loss. They couldn't find anything wrong with him. They were irate. And it's amazing to me how, and this is another little side note here. <laughs> it's amazing to me how atheists can get so mad about somebody they don't believe in. They can tell you, I don't believe there's a God, but they say they hate him. If you don't believe in him, how can you hate him? And, and, and this is where we're coming down to. These folks was irate. They were come to the point of just irrational in what they did. In fact, in verse 6, it says that these princes and these presidents, they assembled together to the king and said to him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the prince, and the counselors, and the captains have consulted together to establish a rule. To say, Let's stop right there. They lied. Not only are they irrational, but they lied. Daniel hasn't approved this. Daniel don't know this is taking place. But yet all the presidents, he says, all they convincing Darius that this is a good thing. That a decree is to be signed, that a decree is to be given, that no one was to make an application, no one was to appeal to any other God, any other being, except for you, old King Darius. Huh. So the king signed a decree. Daniel finding out that the decree was signed, <coughs> the Bible says that he went to his place by his window facing Jerusalem and prayed. Now again, why did Daniel do that? I can tell you why, because I've read 2 Chronicles. And, uh, and you're getting ready to find out. <coughs> now, there's nowhere in the Bible that commands us to pray three times a day. It's not there. Now, Muhammad 
caught on to what Daniel done, increased it to five times a day, and declared that you are to pray towards Mecca, but now in the last five to ten years, they've changed that. They don't pray towards Mecca anymore, but because of their desire to annihilate Jerusalem and all the Israel people, they had declared that Jerusalem is their holy city, and now they pray towards Jerusalem, a made-up religion, stealing a thought of God. And if you hear that on YouTube, that's what it is. Truth is truth. <clears throat> but in the process of this, in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, this is where he gets it from. Now, this is the building dedication, if you will, that Solomon is dedicating the, the, the temple of God that he has built. Now, this temple that Solomon built was so magnificent so glorious that it is said that dignitaries, when they came into view of this tremendous temple, would actually stop and many would dismount and just take in the glorious picture of the temple that was ahead. It would probably be a good selfie spot today. It would be a photo spot that people would gather to take pictures. It was a glorious temple and at the very height of celebration. Listen to what Solomon says. We're going to pick up the reading somewhere around verse 30. We're going to start at 36, and if I feel I left anything out, we'll back up. But it says, it, it, this, this, this is the words of Solomon to the people, to, to God in his prayer. If they sin against thee, for there is no man which sinneth not. And thou be angry with them, and, and deliver them, listen closely, and deliver them over before their enemies, and they carry them away captives into a far off or near land. Where's Daniel? He's being held captive in a foreign land. Verse 37, it says, And if they bethink themselves in the land, whether they are carried captive, and turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned, we have done amiss, we have dealt wickedly. If they return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, whether they be carried them captives and prayed towards their land. What's their land? Jerusalem which thou hast given unto the fathers and to the city, which thou hast chosen, to the house which I have built for thy name. So right here in Chronicles, Solomon is telling them that if you get caught because of the sins of the nation and you are taken away in captivity in a foreign land, pray to your land. Pray that God, Daniel did not go. <clears throat> we don't know what he prayed. But I think we've got a good idea with Second Chronicles and all that has taken place. I got a good idea. He did not go to that window to pray towards Jerusalem. God, I thank you that you have kept me safe all these years. I, I thank you that you have bestowed upon me all of this wealth and all of this prestige and all of this position and all of this power that I've been able to take in this land. I, no, 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 no. Daniel sat down and he knelt facing Jerusalem, crying out from the depths of his heart, Father, forgive your people of your sin at 80 years old being held captive for 70 years and them trying to make him into a Babylonian turn him into all these things all Daniel wanted to do was go home he wanted to go home and his prayer was that God forgive us of our sins direct us back to your land bring us back into fellowship with you I want to go home I want to go home I want to go home somewhere in our hearts we need to have a desire to go home if we're going to please God. You see, these that were against there, you know, the, those that please God is a blessing to man, but that is the same thing that brings about condemnation, trials, criticism. Because these men, they knew exactly where to go find Daniel. They went, they seen him in his window. Man, he was praying just like he always prayed. 
And they turned around and they went back to King Darius. And, and you can read it for yourself. We'll not take time to go through all of it. But, but in the midst of this, they, they found out that these decrees, and understand that the, the decree of a, a means and emerge, a, 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 the Greek decree was more powerful than king. In fact, in this particular chapter, there, the, the verses are mentioned that can't be changed and can't be altered and this, that, and the other. So they come back to the king. Oh, King Darius. <laughs> Now, he didn't, they didn't come back and say, look, you know that you signed a decree and Daniel's up there praying anyway. They didn't do that. They, they came. And they spoke before the king in verse 12. So hadn't you signed a decree? You can see the snake in the grass already. Hadn't, didn't, hadn't you signed a, a decree, O king? That every man that ask a petition of any god or any man within 30 days save thee, a, O king, was be cast in the den of lions? The king answered and said, This is a true thing, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. And then they said, King, that Daniel, that's what they said in verse 13. It says, that Daniel. You can just sense the hatred in their hearts for Daniel. That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity, reminding him he is a slave, he's exiled, he's not a Babylonian, he's, he's not a Greek, he's not of us. That, cat, that Daniel regardeth not thee nor to decree, for he makes his petition before he is God. The question that comes up today is are we going to be faithful to God? And, and can, can, can I give you the obvious answer? The obvious answer is there's no way that we cannot be faithful to God because it is His faithfulness to us that is our reflection of our faithfulness to Him. It is because He is faithful to us that we're even possible that we can be faithful to Him. We cannot be faithful to God on our own. We cannot be faithful to God with our own strength, with our own knowledge their own will we cannot be faithful to God it is because God is faithful to us that we're able to be faithful to him because God has already given us you realize that the law is not a bad thing we make it a bad thing we don't man especially in today's church because of generation x and generation what is, is it generation x not the millennial generation and I've got a message coming about that in a couple months. I'm not ready to, to, to delve into that completely, but you can't have everything you want. Millennial generation, I just want you to hear that. I love you. I love you. You need to be in church, but you can't have everything you want. <laughs> uh, again, I'm not going to charge you nothing for that one. That's for later on, but in the process, that we, we need to know today that our faithfulness depends upon our obedience to God. We can't do it in our own strength. You see, God's given us the law for a reason. In fact, it's in Romans, Romans chapter. Thank you, Lord. How about that? Now, can you tell me what verse is in, please? Seven. Here we go. The law is a good thing. You see, we, we've made it a bad thing because we, we don't like the law, do we? We don't like to be called legalistic, do we? Danny, you can say amen right there. Amen. Thank you. We don't like to be considered legalistic. The word traditional is an ugly word when you start talking about the church. But I want, I've got some news for you. You can't have one scripture without having another. Now, I want you to listen real closely. Paul says in Romans chapter 7, in verse 7, it says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No. 
I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. You see, it's because of the law, we know sin. And because we know sin, we know we're sinners. And we know that because we're sinners, the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life. The law's a good thing. Paul says, I would have known any better if it wasn't for the law. In verse 12, he says, wherefore the law is, I, this is going to blow your mind, the law is holy. done because there's more I just want you to get used to that and the commandment is holy and just and good folks our faithfulness can only come by knowing the law because we have sinned we are identified sinners by the law. We may not like it. But that's reality. But it's because of the law we know that we are sinners. And because we know we are sinners, we can attribute ourselves to the opportunity of grace. And have our sins forgiven by the grace of God. Day in and day out. I got news for you today too. There's not a one of you sitting here in this building that is perfect. Not one. Uh, no, 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 not one. You don't have to live around me long to find out that that's true. I'm not perfect. Neither are you. That's why we need a Savior. That's why we need Jesus in our life. That's why we need to know that the Lord, that that's what Jesus did. You know what Jesus did? He came not to rescue us from the condemnation and the wrath of the law. I've heard that preached. That's not why Jesus came. He came to fulfill the law. He came in order that he could live the law for you. So that those things which are sin to us, we can say Christ, because he is our propitiation, he is our substitute. We can look to Christ and say, this is my sin. This is what I struggle with. You may not struggle with the same sin I struggle with. I don't struggle with the same sins you struggle with. So we can go to God and because the law has revealed our sins, we can go to the Lord on a daily basis because he's already lived it. He's already fulfilled the law for us that we can go to him and say, Father, I need your forgiveness through your Son, the blood that he shed, that I can have life and have it everlasting. Now ask yourself the question, can you be faithful to God? I would say to you there's no other option. Oh, you can choose different ways. <laughs> but what's the benefit? For me, And it has nothing to do with the, those, those that have gone on before. We can't hold in the grasp of our hands the loved ones that we think that are in heaven for our righteousness. Oh, we've got some good people. I, my mom and dad are there. I have no doubt in my mind. In June, I don't even know how many years it's been. I don't keep up with it. Um, my mom passed away in 1983. She was a mentor to me. She taught Sunday school lessons. That flannel graph stuff. She put a lot of time she taught me when I was a first grader in Sunday school at church. But that didn't figure in the fact that she taught it at home. 
until I went off to college. Because she felt like she had to prepare, she had to practice. So every Friday night, before we went to bed, sometime or another, she'd get her Sunday school lesson. She'd get her flannel board. And some of you young kids don't know what flannel board is. It's not pajamas. She'd get her flannel board and she'd sit there and she'd teach us all the lesson, whether we want to hear it or not. I love that woman. But that's not why I'm striving to get to heaven for her. My dad, he was one of those man's men. He was rough. He was man of the he, he was a farmer. He 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 didn't say a whole lot, and I can probably count on my hands and toes the number of times that he actually said the words, I love you. That was his generation. But it was those moments. For instance, there was this one time that there was a lot going on in our household and the grass wasn't cut and this, that, and the other. And one of the neighbors <laughs> kind of lectured Dad about, you know, you, you need to keep your grass cut and this, that, and the other. And us boys were out in the yard and he said, you need to keep your grass cut. And I, I, he, he, didn't, he didn't know that we were standing that close, but I never forgot what he told him. He looked in the eye, he said, sir, I'm not raising grass, I'm raising boys. Oh, man, why don't we raise boys and girls instead of all this other stuff? I love my dad. He showed me things in his blindness that I've still not been able to do with my sight. But that's not what I'm going to heaven for. I've got two brothers, but that's not what I'm going to heaven for. I'm going to heaven because back in Chronicles, Solomon says to pray, looking to the holy city. The only holy city we've got to look forward to is the New Jerusalem. We're just pilgrims here. We're exiles here. We're captives here, and we have been put here to prosper. We have been put here to flourish. We have been put here to build our houses, to, to have our families, to move forward and be faithful to God in order that God's faithfulness through us might be seen amongst men and that we might be able to be elevated because of our faithfulness of God in our lives, to our lives, and for our lives. Our purpose to go to heaven is because Jesus said that I died that you might have life and have it abundantly, and I go to prepare you a place that where you are where I am that you may be also and that in my father's house are many mansions and if we're not so I would have told you and he says he makes a promise that I've gone to prepare one just for you but more than all of that Jesus says that I've gone to sit at the right hand of the father and make intercession for you and me I got news for you today the reason why I'm going to heaven is to be able to see the one for whom been faithful to me and his name is called Jesus all the other stuff is just gravy. <laughs> oh, you can't have a good bowl of rice if you don't have a little bit of gravy. <laughs> All the other things are just gravy. I'm going to see Jesus, the one that's been faithful, so faithful to me. <laughs> All I can do here on this earth is be as faithful as I can in keeping the law of God through the grace of Jesus Christ. The church that can leave the greatest impact and footprint in any community would be one that's made up of people that are being faithful to God. Asking forgiveness of our sins, knowing that we all have sinned and come short of His glory. That church would leave a footprint. A question that Rick Rayner asked in his book, The Externally Focused Church, in the opening chapter, a couple paragraphs in, he asked the question, if your church ceased to exist, would the community know it's gone? If we're a church that is faithful to God, 
making sure that our kingdom suffers no loss. Oh, we'll be a church that's faithful to our God, impacting people. Oh, there'll be some that are not going to like it, but God's going to be faithful. As Susan comes to the piano, I, I have to ask you today, <clears throat> have you been faithful to God? Do you love him today? Because he loves you. If you're here today and you've not accepted, you've not received Jesus as your personal Savior, why? There's nothing, there's nothing, absolutely nothing more powerful than the blood of Jesus. And he's ready to extend that to you today. If you'd only come to him and say, Father, I have sinned. We all have. I, I can't make you. I, I can't go to your hand and take you by the hand and say, come on, you need Jesus. That's your decision. You've been fighting it. You've been struggling with it. You know that. You can look around and you can say, well, you know, I, I was in church. I've done the church thing. Church is not going nowhere. We still like for you to do the church thing. But more importantly, God would want you to do the church thing. All God you do is just turn to God and, Father, forgive me for I've sinned. I want to ask you will stand with every head bowed and every eye closed. <clears throat> now, this is something I don't really do a whole lot, but I, for some reason I feel it in my heart to do it this way. But with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you've never received Christ as your personal Savior and you feel like today is that day, would you be willing to slip your hand up and say, Pastor, please pray for me. If you know that today is the day that you need to receive Christ, would you raise that hand? As God is lingering, maybe you're here today and you've backslid and you know that you're not in relationship with God the way you ought to be. Oh, you've fallen so far away, you don't think that you can get back. All I can tell you is God's waiting to run to you. <laughs> he knows exactly where you are. Would you be willing to, to raise that hand and say, Father, forgive me. I am that prodigal. God bless that hand. I see that God bless that hand. Amen. We're going to pray. And if you would just pray in your heart, God will forgive you your sins. But then that's the profession of your mouth. But the Bible also says that, that you're, you're, you're to make that public profession. Make the changes. Do what God's called you to do. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Lord, uh, to use an unworthy vessel such as this to proclaim your word. Just pray, Father, that you would hear the prayers of those that are praying, even those that may not have slipped their hand up and know that they, they need you in their life. Hear that prayer. Oh, I cry out to you, Father, hear that prayer. Forgive us, Father, of our sins. We have no holy city here on this earth. Oh, but we're longing for that city built by God. That's the temple of the living God. Help us, Lord, to be faithful day in and day out that we might be a church that would imprint their community in a positive way for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to ask you will to be seated. And uh, as our Kids from Children's Church, looks like they've begrudgingly come back. <sighs> yeah.
guys can sit. You can sit with your parents or you can come sit on the pew, whichever you want to do. <coughs> Kylie, you can stay right here. You can sit here. Um, this past week, um, Sarah texted me and, and um, she said that Kylie had come to her and, and uh, was concerned for her soul. That she needed Jesus. And, it, you know, as a pastor, I, I, that, that's good stuff to me. But, you know, as a mom, <coughs> there ain't nothing no better than to be able to know that your child trusts you enough to make that eternal decision, to have Christ in their heart. So we got talking and planning this day. She goes out there and gives a baseball to what for. And the baseball told her not down. <laughs> and she ended up with a cast on her hand. But we text all day yesterday or Friday, yesterday, sometime or another, how to figure this thing out. So we got it figured out. I told her I would, instead of holding her for five minutes, I'll only do four minutes and 13 seconds so the cast will survive. <laughs> but we've got it figured out, and we're going to baptize this young lady into the kingdom of the Lord. And as we do so, as we begin to make preparations, we're going to ask you to stand, and we're going to sing a couple of verses of when we all get to heaven. We'll sing and shout the victory. I think y'all know that well enough to sing it without somebody leading you. You think? Well. Wow. We'll see. Okay. Sarah, if you and Kylie go get ready, and I'll go get ready. So. Oh, thank you, Bernie.
day that is going to be. We all get to heaven. And And for it to sink in and begin to get into their minds and their hearts, that they'd come to their mom and their dad and say, I, I, need, I need Jesus. So it's today that we celebrate that and, and with joy that we come together to baptize this young lady. Come on, come on. I told you we got it figured out. <laughs> We, we, we talked about a lot of different things, but duct tape and a trash bag works. <laughs> As Kylie had come and she had prayed with her mom and we prayed for her and with her, she came knowing that, that she needed forgiveness of her sins. Her desire is to be in heaven. Amen. Her longing is to know that her heart is with God. And that she can live day to day knowing that she's her, his child. And she's made that confession in her heart. She's made it with her mouth. And today, she makes that public profession before all of you. Her family that has come, her friends, her church family, to say, I now belong to the family of God. <laughs> Amen. Ain't that a tremendous statement to make? It's with great pleasure and celebration that we're able to join together with this family and baptize this young lady. Okay, I'm going to ask you to turn and face your mom. We're going to have a short prayer and then we'll baptize again. Okay. Our Father, we come to you on behalf of Kylie. We thank you for that profession of faith. Lord, those words spoken. And Lord, this young life that we know that you're going to use for thy glory. We pray that you would continue to guide her. Help her mom and dad and their family, Lord, to continue to put things in her way, to strengthen her her walk with Christ. Lord, the church may do the same, that we might love her, pray for her, encourage and mentor her. And Lord, it's with great pleasure that we welcome her into the family of God. Lord, it's this day that we baptize Miss Kylie in the name of the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit. Give God the glory. Give him that praise. Go ahead. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our choir is going to come up and uh, with a traditional song, and we're going to give y'all an opportunity to hug on her, love on her in a little bit. And uh, so, just give us a few moments to get dry clothes on. Okay.
walking on the highway with my Lord. My name is written down in the courts above. It's shouting time in heaven. Oh, yes, it's shouting stage, please. Uh, on behalf of the church, we do want to uh, give you a couple of things. First of all, we want to give to you a certificate of baptism that simply says that you were baptized on this day on May the 5th here at Bethlehem Church, and it's got my autograph on there. It may be worth something one day. Uh, it's just, and also we want to give you this Bible it's a study Bible it's not just to look cute on your nightstand but it's to be used there's a lot of things in here to help you grow to reference a lot of things that you may be going through it's an easy good study Bible for you and I expect it to be worn out when you come back and ask for another one in a couple of years okay congratulations we love you and I'll, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> We're also going to, at this time, uh, present her to the membership of the church uh, to receive her into the family of God. And, and that's, uh, that's something always exciting, too, is to be a part of that and to, to share that experience. So what is the favor of the body to receive her as a member of the church? All in favor of that, say aye. aye. 
No, keep, keep standing there. Don't go nowhere. Stand right there. <laughs> now, I've got to, I said earlier that nobody's perfect. Uh, somewhere in the midst of everything, I made a mistake. So I'm going to correct that today. I don't know how it slipped through the cracks. Miss Amy, would you come up here, please? We talked. Um, she's been baptized. And I thought that we had presented her to the church for membership. But somewhere down the line, I didn't. And I apologize. I'm so sorry. So we're going to do that today. Uh, I'll have to check into the church policy if it's retroactive or not. But. But we are going to do that this very moment. What's the pleasure of the church to receive Amy into the membership of the church? God bless you. All in favor of that? Welcome. <laughs> if I'm going to ask the two of you, if you would to stand right here, we got some people who want to love on you. So just stand right there. And uh, this is your time of dismissal. You can liberty go in the fear of God as God leads you and guides you. But do take the opportunity to come and, and greet these folks and let them know you're praying for them. And uh, we're going to start here and let you work your way around, okay? But I'm first. Welcome to the family of God, darling. I love you. Oh, yeah. 